All right, it is eight o'clock. And uh, let's see if I can actually get this to pop over and show me. Uh, maybe it won't. Um, welcome to the Nibby Callers chat for uh, Saturday, November 14th. This week, I think Helen is going to start out by talking a little bit about what square dancing looks like in Sweden. And we've got folks from various other places. And yeah, we'll have a little bit of a discussion about the regional variations in square dance culture. Helen, are you ready to take this away? Uh, yeah, I, if you let me, I'll share my screen and hopefully it'll come I up. I think you should be ready to go. So uh, take it away. Can you see my screen now? I can see your screen. Okay, good. Uh, well, yes, thanks, uh, uh, Dan. I, I've been listening to these uh, seminars for six months and I've really enjoyed them. I've learned such a lot, but I've, I've realized, you know, of course we have a lot in common, but there are some things that are different. And um, I, I've been dancing for 10 years. I dance a, up to A1. I learned up to A1 without any problem. Then I got to A2 and somehow it wasn't quite so easy anymore, but maybe that was because I was beginning, you know, to look into calling and maybe my brain was being used up for all this uh, caller stuff. Um, so, and my experience, uh, I've danced of course a lot in the Stockholm area where I live. I've danced around Sweden a bit. I've been in Norway. I've been in Scotland. Uh, I've actually danced in Beijing to uh, Brian Hotchkiss when he was there. I was lucky enough to be there when there was a festival. And I've also danced in uh, Australia to Brian at a, a local club evening there somewhere just north of Sydney. I, I'm, I can't remember the club, but it was a great afternoon, so evening. So that's my experience. And of course, um, before I listened to all these seminars, ours, I just thought that it was the same everywhere, but I really realized it isn't quite. So I'm going to talk a little bit about square dance in Sweden. And I see that I have uh, some Swedish friends with us here. So um, um, they may be able to answer questions that I can't answer later on. Uh, but um, we started dancing in square, da in square dance here in Sweden, or just in many clubs date back to the 1980s. And it came to Sweden, um, apparently some people, some Swedish people living in Brazil danced there and then they took it to Saudi Arabia when they were stationed there. And in Saudi Arabia, uh, a couple, Swedish couple danced it and brought it back to Sweden. And so that's kind of the way uh, square dance came to Sweden. And uh, I've only been in this uh, group or in this uh, circle for 10 years, but I believe square dance was uh, quite big in the 80s and 90s, and then slowly began to uh, sort of, the numbers started to fall. I'm not sure, I'm sure there are others out there that can tell us more precisely. You're right. Uh, yeah, but um, in the two, uh, 2020 this year, uh, we, have, we have a Swedish Association of American Square Dance Clubs, and they have registered 3,346 dancers. Uh, 69 of them are um, youth, and that is their should be under 25, but I think the ages are going up a bit as the 25 year olds don't want to leave. Uh, and we have 108 clubs, which, you know, easy math, there are not very many people in each club. I can say that 10 years ago, the numbers were 5,000, just over 5,000 dancers in 134 clubs. Um, and callers and teachers, they are uh, organized in the Swedish Association of Callers and Teachers. And uh, at the moment, they have 75 members. Uh, I know that some of the members aren't callers or teachers, uh, and there are some callers and teachers who aren't uh, in, in the SACT, S-A-C-T. Uh, so I'd say that I think I'm not doing too badly if I say that less than 100 callers in Sweden. So, um, and there are 10 million people. So that sort of gives you some kind of reference. Uh, there are no fully professional callers. Some callers have um, worked full time, but they've had some other arrangements to help their economy. Some uh, callers, I think, sort of don't work full time to be able to do 
a bit more calling. So there are no professional callers, and I don't think there ever have been, but I, there, I'm not sure. This is just uh, uh, what I think. Um, SACT uh, organizes uh, some, uh, it's a long time since we had a scholar school. Uh, we do have some uh, courses for uh, our callers and teachers. Uh, the last few caller schools I've been to have been uh, either I went to one with Jerry Justin after he'd been here calling for a big dance. <laughs> I've also been to GSI, uh, GSI uh, uh, schools and with Walt Burr in J Gothenburg uh, a few years ago. Um, these seminars or these uh, scholar schools, they're in English and for some people that is a little bit um, uh, they feel a little bit uh, not quite um, free to talk or they're free to talk, but they can't quite express themselves properly. So it doesn't give them absolutely full value. So that's why it would be very good if we could have some Swedish caller schools also. But these caller schools we've been to have been just fantastic. Um, a square dance clubs, they're run by the members through a board. Uh, and um, quite often uh, the caller or if there are several, call several callers involved, the main caller will uh, be, uh, attend the board meetings, but that's not always the case. And of course, there are some clubs where uh, the caller more or less manages the club, but officially it's, it's the board that uh, runs the club. You pay your membership fee and you pay, pay for the courses that you're going to attend. Uh, and um, well, it's the club members that run the whole thing. Uh, the, one of the clubs, I, I've been involved in three clubs and in the, one of the clubs uh, now you take turns of sort of arranging the coffee break and that kind of thing. Um, and it's the club that organizes the courses and uh, dances and who hires the callers for all these different events. And some of the dances are stores, they're big dances, main dan and, uh, and we uh, have callers from well, Australia, United States, Canada, well, anywhere we can find a, a caller we can afford, a good caller. Um, they will be hired and they, we will have some wonderful, wonderful dances. And arranging these dances is one of the main sources of income for the clubs. Uh, so it's important and a dance will be arranged by the uh, all the club members you pull together you come there the evening before you get this hall set up you get up the cafeteria set up and uh, everything and then uh, afterwards you have to get everything back home again and clean the hall and that kind of thing but it is a main source of income so it's very important uh, that we have these dances if you're a member of a club through the SASDC, you also have your an, an insurance against accidents during the dance. Um, yeah, at the moment we're not dancing, of course. Here in Sweden, we're facing the second surge of the pandemic, and things are not looking good at the moment. Uh, all the Numbers are going in the wrong direction, so I don't think there will be any dances or courses for a long time, but we will just have to wait and see uh, what happens. But there are, are vir there is virtual uh, square dancing and they dance up from the basic level up to the C3A level uh, here. I think many of us dance to, uh, to you American and, and uh, all the other callers that have these virtual dances. Um, ha having clubs run by your members through a board is a very usual form of activity. There are many other activities that are, are designed in this way. So this is very natural for us uh, uh, to sort of organize us in this way. And of course, unfortunately, <laughs> it's not like uh, being the present president of the United States where you really, you really want to be it badly. Uh, you have problems finding people for the boards. Um, it's a, a lot of uh, unpaid work, but of course it's fun uh, also. You, you get involved and you get to have a say in how things are done. So it, it works that way. Uh, some boards are very good and active. Some boards are not so good and active, but uh, it works. We all get to dance anyway. Um, 
A club night typically lasts for about three hours. Uh, we have a little coffee break in the middle. Uh, in my club, it's meant to be 20 minutes, but uh, we like talking, so sometimes it goes on for a little bit too long. Uh, but that's uh, we uh, that's what we plan. We have one uh, course that starts at um, seven o'clock and then goes on for uh, one hour and uh, 20 minutes, and then we're meant to have our break. And um, at the moment, we're we have two levels at each time, so we have two callers involved. Um, I teach the basics, and then there's another caller taking some other level. Then we have the coffee break, and after the coffee break, there will be uh, another level or two. Uh, and um, uh, well, that's the way it works. We have a lot of single dancers, of course, and we have a lot of, of women who want to dance. I think this is quite normal that there are more women than men that want to dance. And so um, a lot of us learn to dance, the left hand dancer or the man dancer. And I actually was graduated as a male dancer or a left hand dancer because I was told that uh, if I learned to dance on the left hand side, I would get to dance much more. And then uh, there was no doubt in my mind that I better become a left hand dancer. Uh, and I, so I graduated as a left hand dancer. And it does mean that um, you know, it's wonderful when you can dance left and right hand without any problem. Um, and then we only have square dance at our evenings. We don't have any rounds or, or other things that you talk about, which I don't really know what they are, uh, because we only uh, dance square dance, which means that we get in quite a few tips each evening. Uh, and we tend to dance quite a lot. The breaks between the tips are typically just time enough to be able to to get off the floor and to regroup and to get onto the floor. And as we have a lot of single dancers, um, typically maybe if you come as a couple, you'll dance the first tip together. But then after that, uh, I'm quite happy to dance with someone's husband. <laughs> uh, and uh, I've never as a single dancer had problems finding someone to dance with. But of course, I can ask a man or a woman to dance, and then on the way to the floor, we can decide who's going to dance to the left and who's going to dance to the right. And this, of course, makes, makes it much easier to find a partner. Um, yeah. And here, I think, is the big difference. We dedicate one year each to basic, mainstream, and plus. Uh, I think, I don't know how it's up higher up because I, I, the clubs I'm involved with don't have these uh, levels. I've been to other places to learn A1. Uh, so after a year, we've uh, taught our basic dancers all the, all the calls and we graduate them. And then um, the next year, typically you actually, you'll, you'll dance basic a few weeks. Uh, some of them have to be reminded, of course, after the, you know, the long summer break that, that what basic is, and then we'll gradually start teaching them the mainstream calls. Um, and it takes a while, uh, and that's because we have pretty high expectations, I think, of our dancers. We expect them, you know, to be able to dance half sachet, um, all the calls that is possible to dance half sachet, and we also dance from um, different positions. We don't just dance, you know, the ordinary standard position, but we try to, to to teach them uh, well, different positions and so on. And um, when they've learned all the calls in mainstream, which I mean, isn't all that many, um, then we have dance training or dance practice, dance training, um, uh, until you know, the calls really uh, are in their legs as well. So that you can just do them automatically. Um, we, I've, ta I've thought about the regional differences, and um, after discussing with this with Hanna, which I think Anna, you're here too, um, we teach all our, cord our calls according to the Color Lab definitions. Um, maybe I mean, I've also no noticed when I've been out on the few places I've been dancing that that um, there are different sort of uh, hand clappings and calling outs and quacking and all kinds of things that happen uh, that I think is just sort of natural as the way it's done. When you come somewhere else, it's, there are different things that are, are done, but the, the actual dancing and the definitions we do according to Color Lab. And we do quite a bit of twirling, uh, especially uh, younger dancers like to twirl a lot. So 
weave the ring can be really fancy sometimes. Um, yeah. Uh, and that was my last slide. So that's all I had. Cool. So yeah. I noticed that uh, Shani is on from Japan. And I don't want to put her on the spot, but if Shani wants to pipe in and talk about what it's like over there, that'd be cool. How that uh, changes. Sure. Um, uh, first of all, it's 1.15 in the morning over here. So if I'm a little bleary eyed, I apologize. Um, <laughs> while, while Helen was talking, I was kind of taking notes because I wasn't sure what to talk about. Um, but I was trying to think of what the differences were in Japan while I was listening to Helen talk about Sweden. Um, my name is Shani. Uh, I've been dancing since, uh, I don't remember, like 2006 or five or four or seven or somewhere around there. Um, and I learned uh, square dancing, well, uh, technically in Canada when I was in grade six. Um, but then uh, as an adult, uh, I started to learn in Japan. Uh, so I'm actually, I'm wearing a Canada shirt. I'm from Canada, but, um, but I learned how to square dance in Japan. Um, I've danced in, uh, I hadn't made a list here so I could remember, Japan, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Netherlands, Germany, and Sweden so far. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, so I belong to um, uh, the local club in my town uh, or in my city called Scuba Square Dance Club. Um, the club has existed since 1981. Um, and uh, square dancing, I, I feel like square dancing sort of came like started happening in Japan in maybe the 1970s or so I'm guessing I obviously wasn't here at that time I was only just being born <laughs> but uh, um, I've been in Japan since 1995 though so I've been here for almost half of my life um, so um, my club okay where should I look here uh, my club has one leader who is not a caller um, and he has been, I say one leader because he's literally been the leader since 1981, the same guy. Um, and we have about nine callers, um, all of whom are volunteers uh, and, um, and who, who rotate throughout the, 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 the evening. So um, it's usually from six until seven, there's um, plus or something special happening. And then from seven until 9 p.m. And this is on Saturdays. Um, uh, the other uh, dancers, like regular dancers and learners, uh, will come during that time. And it's um, one of the callers is in charge of the education committee, and they decide the order of the tips uh, and who's calling. Um, so usually the callers maybe only call once or twice per night, uh, one one or two tips per night. I mean, um, uh, there are about eighty members um, in my club maybe about, let's see, five or so um, squares on a normal evening though. Um, right now it's COVID, so um, they're actually, they actually are dancing. I, I understand, I haven't been, um, because I, I, I'm the principal of a school and I just don't feel comfortable um, getting infected. <laughs> like, uh, don't wanna, I don't want to spread that to my school, so I haven't been going. But from what I understand, they've been doing it with um, batons or, and gloves and, of course, masks and, and uh, in a very, very big square, a uh, uh, very, very big hall. Um, but I haven't been going, so I'm not quite sure how that's working. Um, there's a membership fee in my club. It's a about $100 uh, roughly per year. Um, and also, you have to pay a, a bit extra. It's about maybe, I don't know, two. 20 bucks or 25 bucks for um, membership in the Japan Square Dance Association. And you get like newsletters and stuff like that from them. Uh, 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 uh. In, okay, going on to Japan in general, um, there's probably, I'm guessing around 10,000 square dancers in Japan, maybe a little bit less. Um, I'm not quite sure, but higher, is it higher, Walt? The last word I heard from Okiyoshi san was there something like 15,000 now? 15,000, okay. Yeah, so like lots more than you might think <laughs> in Japan. <laughs> um, they have a convention once a year. Um, some of you may have been to it. I know Walt's been to it regularly. Um, I'm not sure if any, and maybe Janice as well, since I know she danced in Japan as well. Um, uh, the Japan Square Dance Association uh, exists and has, a, has an office with paid staff. I don't know how many of them are paid, but uh, some of them are paid. 
uh, in, and it's an office in Tokyo. Uh, there's caller training set up uh, per like at least once per year at the national level. And then there's like um, sections like uh, like Kanto area and the Kansai area and Kyushu and stuff like that. So there's different uh, uh, calling train caller training happening there. Um, there's some top level callers, but I wouldn't say, I, I don't think they're right. I don't think it's right to say professional. I don't think that their only job is calling. Um, they're, they're like elite callers, I would say, and they can uh, fetch quite a fee, shall we say, when we have the dances, but they're not, um, that's not their only job. They're usually like researchers, scientists, and <laughs> things like that. And then uh, on the weekends, they're calling. Um, there's a lot of uh, women uh, in square dancing in Japan, um, but my club is quite unique in that I don't know if we're half and half, but there's a lot of men um, in my in my club for some reason. I don't know what the what the real what the reason for that is. Uh, going on to um, the culture in Japan of dancing. Um, one thing you might notice in Japan is that people don't smile when they're dancing and it drives me bananas. <laughs> you might have noticed that as well. They're all very serious and, you know, trying to get it right. And they're, you know, they're very, that's, I mean, that's Japan as well. People are very serious and they want to do things properly. So um, they dance by the definition as well. Um, uh, there, there isn't a lot of flair. Um, you know, I go off to like Sweden and Germany and, and uh, Australia and I learn these new things and I teach them to them and I'm like, come on guys, let's do it. And they're kind of like, mm, Shani, <laughs> what are you doing, you strange woman? <laughs> and so sometimes I can get them to do some claps, <laughs> but not so much beyond that. Um, I noticed in some countries they do the the alaman left with like holding the person's bellies or I don't know what it is like that. None of that. Um, it's it's all uh, arm holds and things like that for alaman left. Um, we change partners every tip, uh, and it's not common to dance with your actual actual partner, your actual like husband or wife. Um, and it's more like you you lend each other out for the for the good of square dancing. And so it's, uh, as a, I'm single and as a single dancer, it's never, ever a problem. In fact, I'm very popular <laughs> with, uh, with the dancers. Uh, and so I can, I can always get in on a tip if I want to. Um, the calls are of course in English, but that presents a bit of a challenge because uh, unlike Sweden where most people can speak quite a bit of English in my experience, um, Japanese people don't and have quite a bit of difficulty uh, understanding the calls. And so when foreign callers come to, for example, the convention or to, um, you know, the individual um, clubs, uh, it takes a while for the dancers to understand what the, what the native level speaking, native English speakers are saying. Um, and also when I started to call, my own club was like, Shani, just say it properly. <laughs> so I'm doing like, Aramando Defto. <laughs> and like, yes, yes, that's proper. <laughs> Talk properly, Shani. Your, your pronunciation is terrible. <laughs> so, um, the, there are very, very short breaks between tips. Uh, it's like, it's very fast paced and like timed down to the minute. So like, you know, seven minutes and then, a, and then a break and then seven minutes and then a break and that sort of thing. And, and so when I first saw the, uh, a timetable of a, of a dance, I was very, I'm like, really, really, we're going to be stopping exactly at blah, 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 oh, three. And, and yes, they do. It's, it's military timed. It's, it's very well timed. Uh, basic is done usually in about four months, April, May, June, and July. April is the beginning of the school year in Japan. Uh, and so things start in April uh, and usually uh, basic is done by around July, starting to do mainstream. Maybe you'll finish mainstream in one year. They want you to kind of dance that for a while, maybe two or three years before you do plus and plus might be uh, another three or four months or so. Um, I would say that in general, Japanese dancers are quite skilled. Uh, they're, they take it seriously. They study. There's manuals <laughs> that they give you on the first day that you arrive and you're expected to read them and study them and know how to dance properly. I wouldn't say, though, that they get kind of like, they don't get mad. Well, my club members, let's say this, my club members don't get mad when you make little mistakes and stuff like that. Um, so, so that's nice. But they are generally quite skilled dancers. I think that's all. Any questions? <laughs> and can I go to bed now? <laughs> can, I, can I just piggyback on what Shani said for a minute? Yes, of course. Hi, Julie. Hi. Our experience in Japan was amazing. We've been out there to a couple of their conventions. By the way, Shani, we're all staying at your house next time. 
Um, <laughs> Welcome. I mean, I don't know where the next convention is, but sure. <laughs> the, the, what she said is exactly right. The dancers are very, very precise once they get used to understanding you. However, calling it a large Japanese event is a nightmare for a psych car because they I've wear club outfits. Yeah. I'm not talking about one square. There will be two or 300 club members dressed alike. Mm -hmm. So for those of you that are site callers, highly recommend you study modules before you go to Japan. This, this actually, uh, this, I had a funny episode because I feel like I, uh, there's at one dance that I went to, there were two of us who were white, only two. Um, and this, there's a call, you know, Kaneko Jr. He's a famous scholar in in Japan. He kept getting us mixed up. He could not because we're wearing we're we're wearing the same color costume. Everybody else is Japanese though. He can figure all of those people out. It's like, you know, a, a, you know, a dance of like 300 people and he can't figure those people out, but he couldn't figure out me and this other one foreigner and we were because we were opposites and he was he just kept mixing us up all the time. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. Hey, hey Shaney, where do you dance, Shaney? Um I am in Scuba. Scuba, uh, Scuba Square Dance Club with Mr. Honda. Well, whereabouts is that? I mean, I, I dance a lot, you know, you know the Mary Pioneers? Uh, where is that? On a Zaba. Oh, Zama. uh, oh, 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 oh. They're on a Zama. 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 Okay, yeah, that's out near Yokohama, is it? Yeah, yeah. Can tell me? Um, yeah, it's on yeah. the base, one of the bases? Yeah, well, it's out of the, it's in that area, near Kanagawa. Yeah. It's in the Kanagawa. Kind of go Are you south so, of there? No, I'm north of there. So if you think of oh. Tokyo and like yeah. um, Chiba and uh, like we're we're uh, I'm north and east of of Tokyo by about now 45 one, minutes. One one thing to think about in Japan, just just for a second, is they have a lot of dancers, but probably per capita they might not be any more than some of the other areas of the world because they've got like 22 million people in the space of an area in Washington state, it would be like a county or a county <laughs> and a half. They have 22 million people. So per capita, they might not have many more people uh, per capita Maybe. than some of our yeah, other folks. That the population of Japan is, I think, 126 million, maybe. But the population of just Tokyo, like the, the great, let's say the greater Tokyo area, is the same as the population of Canada. <laughs> yeah. so. so there's a lot of pressure, a lot of people pressure there. Yeah. Um, can I, I, have I, a question. I have a question. I, I see you there. One second. For Helen. For the ladies that are on here tonight, the lady callers, Japan has a lot of female callers, but what they don't see, what's very rare, is for them to see a European or American female caller. That's true. They don't they tend to come here for. Happen. When we went out there, hey, Jennifer, could I ask a question, please? Oh, sorry. Well, Walt, Walt, is still, Walt is still talking. When uh, we went out there several years ago, um, we were both on the convention program, and we noticed that when Julie was calling, my halls would empty out because <laughs> they so so rarely heard a European female. That's something to keep in mind. I'll shut up now. <laughs> Daryl? You're muted, Daryl. Yes, I, I know I'm waiting for it to change. Uh, for Shane and Helen both, could you give me an idea what the average age range is within, within your dancers? 60 plus. Uh, definitely, Easy. definitely I'd say 60 plus. Uh, we have, um, I don't know if I mentioned that we have, we have a lot of C1 and above dancers nowadays. So mm -hmm. these dancers get filled up, but the ones with the lower levels uh, aren't always as well um, visited. Workshops, especially if you have a C1 workshop, you'll get it full right away, but basic mainstream plus on, aren't always that popular. Uh, but I'd say, yeah, definitely, uh, maybe 70 plus, what would your other people say? Uh, like seven, maybe 70 even in Japan. Like my club probably is around 70 oh. average age. Like I bring it, I bring it down a little bit, but <laughs> not by much. <laughs> 
I find that interesting. Thank you. So Janice had an observation that she wanted to pipe in. Yeah. Um, so like Shaney, I'm one of the few uh, people that learned how to square dance initially in Japan. Um, I was there a little bit before her and I was in Yokohama. Um, I learned with the Yokohama Sunny Coast Club uh, in like 92 through, I left in 94. Yeah, so, so about three, four years with them. Anyway, what, and I have gone back to visit them since then. In fact, um, we started taking square dance lessons here in Chicago after I got married, just so I could go back and see my club in Yokohama. Um, the big difference that I think Shaney forgot to mention is that, well, maybe it's different for her club, but Yokohama Sunny Coast holds lessons all year round. Their dance format is Saturday night. They get together, they have lessons. Um, for beginners, and then they practice for the people that have been there for a while, and then they intersperse that with, um, you know, regular dances by the various club callers, and that is something I would love to see, uh, you know, clubs in America take on because it it leads to a much better uh, dance quality by the dancers. Is that your experience, Shaney? Um, my club does the does the um, does an annual like every year newbie course um from april to july but um but recently like it's when somebody comes and says they want to learn square dancing and it's like october do you tell them to wait until april this is the problem that we're having uh and so some of the there's one young uh caller young young ish caller in my club who's now saying like when they come let's just workshop them let's get them to where they need to go um, so that we don't have to say, please come back later, uh, you know, when we're, when we're desperate for new members. So um, there's, there's, there's kind of less any things happening all year, but the, the beginner class is really, really right now focused on that area in my club, that, that time, I mean. Oh, and something else I forgot to mention that I think might be different in Japan than other countries is the, there, there are a lot of mainstream uh, uh, events. So you don't have to be plus a, a C or anything like that. You can be a mainstream dancer and you can dance a lot in Japan. Yeah, uh, here in, in Sweden, we have, uh, we have dancers for basic dancers. We even have that. We typically you'll start in the, a new course in September. And we also have the problem with, you know, if someone comes in, in January, what do you tell them? But we basically usually start our course in September, which means that by Christmas, their basic they have no 34 calls or something, or maybe up to 40 or something like that. So we will have dances where one of the, uh, we have a basic 40 or basic 35 as one of the, the levels. So we'll have a basic 34, we'll have a mainstream tip, we'll have another basic 34, we'll have a plus tip and like this, so that the lowest level will be dancing at least or be able to dance every second tip. Uh, but um, I think the last few years, there's been a little trend to the fact that when they arrange um, dancers, they don't always want to have the lowest level because they know that there are more dancers at the higher levels. But so uh, yeah, still, I think if they're transiting for the pocket pocket money instead of the actual dancers to fill up the pockets in the long term. That I think is absolutely true. Absolutely true. Yeah. yeah. Shane, and just just an observation. What you said there at the end is the the one point I was going to be bringing up. We've had a lot of Japanese dancers come over here visiting Australia. And it's one of their big observations that they've said going um, to North America and now Australia is there are not a lot of venues. They're really limited. They have to do a lot of traveling unless clubs make an exception for them uh, because they, uh, the Japanese dancers, they'd like to travel when they get to get the ability and they travel in packs, mm -hmm. which is, which is quite normal. I mean, it, it's fully expected, but when you, when you say you go to Sydney, well, you've got a mainstream dance, then you've got to go two, 300 kilometers to get to another mainstream dance. There's lots of plus dances, lots of advanced dances. Uh, that's just one of the things. One of the things that is heavy in Japan is they make those venues available for them at basic, at mainstream right. to dance. And it is everywhere. Um, the other thing is uh, you were talking a bit about the history. Um, mm -hmm. There was a history project done on it and it was, I think, 19... 46 is Nagasaki that was introduced and that was part of the occupation and it went through the 50s and the 60s, but it didn't really take off until about 56, I think, and that was uh, Prince Makasi. 
and Mikasa, Mikasa, I'm not, not, Mikasa. Mikasa, yeah. Um, he went to the States, that was part of the venue, it came over and then they, they did a tour then. That's when it actually started to pick up at the four and then it became part of the, pre the education prefectures to put it in all across schools. Mm -hmm. That's where it picked up and through about the 70s to the 80s is when it became really, really prevalent as an activity. And that was a new activity to, to most of the rest of the community. But through the, um, like the islands around Nagasaki, it had been spreading out there since the 40s. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, it clearly came from uh, the American occupation, oh, yeah. I would say. Yeah. Um, I'm not exactly sure where it is, but there was a whole history project. There was a, um, was it Niblo? Winfield Niblo? I think he was part of the education man. He had a lot to do with bringing it in. I think he passed away in the 90s, but he had a lot to do with the development of square dancing in Japan at the time. So I'd love to see that if you have a copy. I, or I, a that's what I say. I was kind of hoping actually maybe you had some. On it, but. I can ask. Uh, I can ask Honda-san about it. I I too would love to see that, and I'm going to have to do some googling when this is when we're done here all, I, all i've got is just the anecdotal history and that was going back because we were talking about the, japan and was doing a comparison actually of japan and germany and canada and whatnot when we were doing part of this development and that's mm -hmm. when we got the history of it ne but, did uh, you say niblo his name is niblo um winston or winfield or something like niblo n-i-l-b n-i-b-l-o n-i-b-l-o-w or something like that I'm not sure, but I know he had something to do with the education development in Japan, and it was the um, like the American Japanese school system prefectures or something like that, and it was introduced into that curriculum that way. I found it. I, I put a link in the comments. And I too tossed a link in the com comments that was uh, different from Janice's link. Ooh, nice. Thanks, guys. <laughs> and there will be more reading later. So, I, you know, I, one, I, oh, sorry, yeah. I was just gonna say, I also put a link of, um, I, I don't know how, um, how, so I put a link to square dance parties or square dance dances. I don't know what you call them in, in, uh, in English, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, in, uh, in Japan. And you can see there that there's a lot of them. Um, and, I mean, you'll have to do Google Translate to see what's going on there. Um, but actually, usually there's like tons, tons, tons more. Mostly they've been, I think, canceled for the, the you know, current times but um yeah there's a, there's tons of events you can go every weekend and dance to i mean you have to travel but uh but you can dance 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 so one of the dichotomies we've got in the united states and i i suspect canada i've only been to one convention in canada me too we have the, the <laughs> yeah um the same one <laughs> yes <laughs> is we have the um the huge cultural break between gay square dancing and straight square dancing. Uh, uh -huh. um, and in my area, I, I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is uh, kind of a gay mecca. There's a little bit less break, I think, than in most places in the country, but it's still very clear that we can go to a, go to a dance where people are actually offended if you dance something other than your birth gender. Uh, uh -huh. 10 miles from a dance where nobody dances their birth gender. Um, yeah, do you guys have that kind of break anywhere? There's no, there's one gay club that I'm aware of. Um, uh, I believe it's a, the 808 uh, in Japan. Um, I would say that homosexuality in general is not sort of widely accepted in Japan. It's um, it's not, they're not intolerant. It's just not a thing. People don't talk about it and they think they don't know anybody who's gay. Um, they're wrong, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's not a big thing. And, and um, even the, I don't know how like, how like open and out uh, that club is about, about it. Um, so uh, I, yeah, it's not, it's not a thing here, basically. It, um, going to Canada and going to that gay convention uh, was my first experience of gay square dancing. And, oh my God, I loved it so much. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely the future of square dancing in my mind. It's so, uh, you know, open and friendly and loud and, and um, muscular and <laughs> young. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. And Mel, any differences between like 
what you're seeing there and what what the culture in uh, or what have what Cheney and Helen have laid out and what the culture in Australia is? Uh, well, like I said, I'm a blow in here, very much like Shaney is in Japan. I'm also from Canada. Uh, I think we Canadians have decided that we're going to do a very subtle takeover of the world and become benevolent. No, don't tell them! <laughs> um, the average age here as well, uh, it, it, it's, it's a bit anomalous in it, but I see it everywhere across the globe is whenever they're trying to promote square dance and they try and get as many young people as they can in the photographs and in the presentations. But the reality is um, the average age of square dancing here is well into their late 50s, 60s, and 70s, with the anomalies being the very few young people in their 40s and then a few teens after that. Um, that that's quite normal. Australia, though, is such a massive country as far as the spread, and the square dance clubs are usually located coastal big cities or areas where that has taken event with large population bases like up the coastal regions of the uh, eastern and western sides of the country where the big cities are. Australia says they have um, what 107 callers with the Australian Callers Federation and about 100 no, sorry 160 callers and 200 different clubs. Uh, I had I started going through some of the listings and there's 107 active callers that I could find at the moment. The number of clubs are still on the books. And um, as I was traveling around Australia, going to uh, call up these people and, and to see if they had a dance going on in the club folded eight years ago. So those records are not there. And that's that's pretty prevalent, which is what I see in a lot of places. There's this discussion right now that a lot of clubs are taking advantage of COVID as an out to close down because they just, you know, it was just time to close rather than die a slow and painful death it was just better to shut down and not restart because of various other things that said the dancers themselves are actually quite active um quite formal in the interpretation and the use of the material that varies from club to club and from state to state but generally you know if you how often do you have a pass through, you know, reverse wheel around into a reverse flutter wheel at a basic or a mainstream dance? Well, that's, that's your basic club. They do a good, good branch range of varied choreography without pushing the DVD concept or the wide and wild and woolly, but standard applications are used quite relatively with variety, which is why it's quite still quite exciting to dance here in Australia. Um, that's why a lot of visitors come here and they find it a, a very fun place to dance. And it's very much like what Shaney was saying. You know, if you go from one place and you go into another place, um, she mentioned the gay, uh, gay square dance clubs. It, it, it's, it's an entirely different venue. Well, it's the same as um, an American dancer going into a European club or going to an ecta jamboree after coming from a, an Australian jamboree or whatnot. It's, it's the same dance material, it's the same choreography, but they are completely different dances because of the mentality. That mentality has not left the actual clubs yet. There's a lot of pride in history in the clubs, but like everywhere else, it is still dwindling. Um, I myself don't call for a club, so I can't really speak on that, but I see Linda in the background. Um, Linda calls for a, a club and shares the calling of a club. So she may have a little bit more to add on that. Linda, are you there? Want to pipe in? Yeah, no, I'm all right. I'm quite happy to listen. Thanks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Gerhard, can you uh, tell us anything about Germany? Or have we lost you? No. No. To unmute, I, think. I need to find the audio button. <laughs> okay, uh, I, I think Helen did a quite a job to, to uh, present a little, so I, I'm using her uh, presentation to, to follow the same uh, uh, lines. Uh, so Square Dance came to Germany after the World War with the American jo soldiers. So it started out in the 50s and uh, I guess the first club in Germany is from the 50s. Uh, but 
uh, as far as, and there came more and more clubs uh, over time, but uh, uh, it was until the 90s that the uh, organizations were taken over by Germans. So until then, uh, the Chorus Association and the Dancers Association both were led by American callers and American soldiers. Uh, when they started to withdraw, then gradually Germans were taking over. And uh, I think and since the late 90s, it's a German only uh, operation, but uh, that was a strong influence. And that's also the same as in Sweden. Everyone is following the uh, color lab uh, definitions. And I think the Germans have a reputation for following orders, so uh, they are really following by the uh, uh, by the book. So uh, the Squadrons clubs uh, is uh, almost the same. That's clubs that uh, are in a register, in an uh, official register, and that's mainly due to uh, uh, insurance reasons. So if somebody uh, slips and breaks an uh, arm or something like that, uh, you are normally covered. Uh, so that is uh, quite similar to, to Sweden. And uh, the main things that the organizations do, the dancers organizations, they hold uh, two jamborees per year. And together with the callers association, they do a student uh, dance jamboree each year so that is uh, one of the main things and the main things of these two organizations is that they uh, cover the uh, music licenses and everything so the clubs have to have a license uh, through the uh, so so for any organizer you need to have a license to to uh, uh, which the organization here is called gema and they are collecting money for, for the uh, uh, producers. And the callers have to have this uh, license to play something openly in public. So this is what you can gain through the two organizations. That's the main uh, topic. Uh, there are, I just recently did uh, some investigation. And uh, so I came up with 470 clubs in Germany that are organized in the, so we are about 80 million people. So, and there are 470 clubs uh, spread over Germany. And uh, well, I don't know how many dancers, I would reckon about uh, 30 dancers per club as an average, maybe less. So you come up with 10 to 20 uh, uh, to 50,000, uh, same as in Japan. Uh, the, Callers, accordingly, some think around 400 callers. So there are some callers that have two. And the amazing thing that I found out is that uh, we are quite high up the ladder that uh, the SSD people describe. So only 50%, we only had four clubs that advertised themselves as basic and only half of them are mainstream only. The rest is into plus A1 and C, and uh, I think there was even more, what is the highest? C3D or something like that? Don't know, but uh, there at least was also one club. So I was uh, uh, amazed how many are already up the ladder into higher levels. And uh, the festivals that we have here uh, are attended mainly by very experienced dancers. I, so I think that uh, what you hear often in discussions that uh, Americans that come to Germany say that there is a very, very high level of dancing. Uh, I think their observation is not wrong because what they observe is quite competent dancers on those uh, things. Uh, but if I'm looking at a lot of clubs, if you're in a single club, uh, I'm not so convinced that this level is really that high. So we have a lot of dancers also that, uh, uh, 
well, they can dance, but they need a lot of training to go to festivals. So that is a, a certain population that's going to festivals. Uh, same as uh, we, uh, the, the teaching is normally up to mainstream in one session and, and one, and then no, that normally starts in September and uh, is supposed to end at Easter. So around Easter or until the summer vacations in July, August, then the uh, graduation is planned. That's what ma many clubs uh, try to do. Uh, but I also know that a lot are not successful. So we need. So I, for for my own uh, uh, example, I normally use a year or more until I'm uh, ready for a. a uh, dem, uh, graduation and we do graduation uh, uh, at mainstream and uh, that's uh, what else uh, the normal club light night is somewhere between two hours and and two and a half or something like that and um, many clubs not all but many clubs do class and uh, uh, mainstream dance at the same evening. So that uh, you spread out between, uh, so you have in the two hour, you have uh, six, seven tips. So then uh, as a mainstream dancer, you on, only have uh, maybe four to go for. And uh, the rest is uh, class. And that's something the clubs have to accept or not, some don't. Then they tr uh, the callers try to have extra nights, um, but they need a lot of angels then to, to fill in. So uh, that is, uh, as everywhere, the age you were talking about is the same as in, in most uh, other countries we have mentioned that uh, I guess it's uh, somewhere in the 60s as an average. There are younger dancers, and those are, of course, the dancers that are more active and more traveling. So you may see something different in uh, festivals, but uh, I guess the average is around 760 uh, or higher. Uh, same as in Sweden, uh, the, uh, we also have a lot of single dancers and uh, mostly women. And uh, so the, what Helena said about uh, that is the same in Germany, I guess. Uh, and uh, there is no, normally no rounds or something else. So that's, you are either a square dance club or a round dance club or a, a clogging club or something like that. But it's, uh, otherwise it's square dance. Uh, at some of the festivals, you have some mixture so that uh, they also have a, a hall for, for round dancing or they have uh, demos for round dancing or something like that. But on the normal club night, that is not mixed. Uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, clubs that have one caller and that is a caller that has been there for many years. And some clubs, uh, try to change callers each night. So they invite callers. That's a mixture. Well, I guess that's some of the facts that I can remember. If you have other questions, go ahead. So one of the things that you mentioned was music licensing. And I remember that one of the features that we put into Square Desk for a German caller, and I don't know if it was you, was a um, was the ability to export a list of what got played that night, because your callers have to report what songs they actually played, whereas we get a blanket license to kind of play anything, and we don't have to keep track of that. Yeah, well, that is part of the agreement between the uh, uh, GEMA, the, the, this authorization uh, uh, authority, and uh, the ECTA, the, the Callers Association, that uh, you have to uh, provide a, call, a, a list of uh, uh, songs 
to the organizer. I mean, it's the organizer of the event who has to uh, talk to the uh, uh, gamer. So, so that's, uh, of course, if your club is the organizer, you have to have, have it yourself. So it's a good thing for a caller that he afterwards can print off saying, okay, this is what I have played. And uh, normally it's just the title. I don't know whether they ever use it, but that's part of the deal. And so, of course, we provide it. And uh, uh, I know that if there are several callers, then we just have a piece of paper and write on the uh, titles and the uh, label, and that's it. I don't. I, I have a suspicion that nobody reads it, but uh, <laughs> it's a requirement. That's, that's a lot more complex than it was when I was negotiating with Gamma in the eighties. Uh, what we had is you had your your events or your venues. They would have to have a music use license for the venue, which was part of their production. So if you a school or a festival hall or something like that, they had their venue license, but all the callers had to have their uh, performance license. And that would cover any of the copyrighted music that was done and that list uh, all the record labels and everything else that were listed, which were produced on copyright, which were recorded with GEMA under ECTA at the time. I think uh, Al Stevens and... Um, Dave Prescott were running it at, and um, uh, Deep, Mark, Deep Mark Creek for the, the round dancing at the time. And how is now, it? In now it, there was no individual recording because that was part of your, your um, performance license, unless you had specific music that was copyrighted but was not produced for square dancing that you were using. Because some people were starting to venture out using things like karaoke tracks and music tracks at that time in the early 80s which didn't really go over well because it started messing up with the music associations and the licensing. But today, as, as I said, it's uh, the, the Callers Association has a, uh, an agreement that you can play uh, the music and then you are covered. Yeah. As a caller, is, if you're a member of ACTA, you, you are covered. So, yeah. uh, but then the club, uh, uh, the uh, Dancers Organization has an agreement with GEMA as well which yeah. includes a club night and uh, yeah, well, basically one club night per week and you don't have to provide anything else uh, uh, then. But if you have a special night or you have a special or uh, that, then you need to uh, put in extra paperwork. You need, need to uh, tell them that this is an extra event and as part of the documentation afterwards, you have to fill in the, these uh, uh, papers to, uh, with the list of songs and things like that. So they can, uh, and uh, that's quite a complex agreement. And yep. uh, I'm happy that I'm not organizing so many events. Mm -hmm. That's uh, um, interestingly in Japan, the copyright thing just doesn't come up. I, I, people understand, you know, you shouldn't copy songs and and that technically you're not supposed to be playing them in public and that sort of thing. But it's not we don't have a, we don't have the thing that you pay into that clubs pay into to uh, license the music. In Sweden, I think I hear um, I'm not quite sure. So um, Lasse Ravit or Hanna or Lars can sort of correct me if I'm wrong. But I think here when you're a member of the SAASDC, there you have in part paid your your sort of your money, your license. Uh, Mikael there, he says I'm right. So good. good. Uh, that's that's the way it works in Sweden. I, I could be wrong about Japan, but I feel like that's not a big thing here yet. I think yet. I think it'll come, but I think it's not quite done yet. Interesting. Yeah, in the US, I believe technically the venue has to have the license, but Caller Lab has set it up so that the caller can carry their license to the venue and we don't have to keep it. We either do less than 50 or more than 50 events a year. So basically, do you have one club or more than one club? And then there is something additional when weekend festivals happen, and I have no idea what that is. So. But Dan, could you tell us a little bit about how it, I, I don't know, maybe it's different in all the different states and United States is a big place, but uh, uh, how does it work uh, in the states with the, the, the clubs? Um, so um, for the, you know, I've only been dancing for eight years and calling for six or five. Um, the club that I learned to dance with is a gay club. Um, 
I'm nominally straight. My wife and I are. Uh, the um, and I believe it has about 160 members and dances five nights a week. It uh, um, at different levels. It inherit. It was there was a a club in that town, and that town only has about 10,000 people. That was an old straight club that was faltering, but had their own hall. And the caller there suggested to some gay dancers, well, why don't you come in and take this club over? And there was a lot of acrimony about that. And then that kind of all happened about four years before we started dancing. But that club has taken off and I think is now actually starting to drop the gay label on their, their dancing. There are straight clubs in my area. Uh, the next town over from that has about a quarter million people in it. And um, <clears throat> that has two straight clubs that each dance a night. Um, and then various others in the area. And they, uh, they tend to, I only go there, go to those places on their weekend uh, hoedowns, they call them. Um, so I only see, you know, kind of the big festival things where they can have five, eight, t even 10 squares. But my impression is that they're probably, the one time I've called for them, they had two or three squares for a given club night. Um, <clears throat> I call for two clubs. Well, before COVID call, called for two clubs. One was a straight dance in a town about 30 miles from me, a straight club, and they were in the process of uh, failing when I started calling for them, their caller called me up and said, uh, would you call for a, or would you, you know, you want to take this over, get a little practice, you'll get a couple months out of it. And that was, I've gotten five years out of it before COVID hit. Um, and we were actually starting to grow. We were up to two or three squares some night, but it was often 12, 14 people kind of thing when, when we were just squeezing along there. And that's very much the two people, the former caller and the club president who traded uh, traded board roles back and forth as they went to kind of keep the club alive. The big gay club has uh, rules in their bylaws about how a, um, a an officer can't be a club officer for more than three years, I think. So that actually keeps some of that uh, rotating through, but in other clubs, the club that was in my town, Petaluma, before or was failing just about the time we started dancing, and we were never even aware that it existed. I talked with their uh, their president sometime when I was getting into calling, and he said, "Yeah, that basically they went along for a decade with the same people in leadership, and eventually those people in leadership got tired of it and failed." The other club that I call for is uh, one that my wife and I started. And so we've been doing that entirely as a, as us run. And there's been a little bit of attempt by one of the dancers in there to try to organize it into a club on its own and give it a board and, um, and leadership from the dance side. But that hasn't really taken off yet. We're doing everything we can to support him in that, but um, he's also got a lot of personal challenges right now. So, uh, so it's still us. We do that on the basis of, we just put a, a big jar out on the table when we come in and have a suggested donation of, I think, seven, seven or $8 a night. And if you multiply the number of dancers by the number of dollars we get, we ne everybody's throwing more in the tip in the jar. So, um, <clears throat> and that club went, we went, uh, we had had some natural disasters here. We have, we've had a couple of uh, big fires during that time, which of course made the area completely smoky. So nobody wanted to do any physical exercise. So that went up and down. And then last, I guess it was last spring. So spring of 2019, we, they club, decided collectively that they wanted to have a, a branding and a, a set of badges. And our first badge order was 23 badges um, with a couple of dancers who, or angels who danced for other clubs and said, I don't need another set of another badge. 
So that says that if everybody showed up on a given night, we would have had three squares, but we had kind of two squares going on. The age range there, the age range in my club in Vallejo, which is the 30 mile away club, is uh, I'm the youngest person there and I'm 52. Um, the Although actually we did pick up two dancers there who were probably my age. The At the club in Petaluma, we have a couple of dancers who I think are 40s, but largely it's 60s or so. Um, the gay club that I started dancing with has a wide variety of, of ages, including at least one who was in sixth or seventh grade when she started dancing. Um, the straight clubs around here are all older. Um, I'm, I'm gonna chime in here and give you a little bit different perspective. I'm in uh, rural Indiana and like the nearest town, the population is like 2000 people. And so then when you go 30 minutes away, you're at about 15,000 people. And if you go 40 minutes away, you're at 20,000 people. So we're not talking a big population area at all. In the, the one town, there's a club, the furthest town away, it's a half an hour. Um, they have a club, there's probably about 20 members. The other club that was the other direction, they actually folded. And I have started a caller run club out of the remnants of that club. Uh, we have nine members now, and um, we're, our name is Dynamic Dancers, and our motto is doing dancing differently. So I have learned quite a bit over all these Zoom sessions as to how things are done differently. And so what we are doing is, and we're actually dancing in person in my own personal residence that people come here. Um, they actually, we have three couples that drive over an hour to get here, um, but we're dancing in my house. And um, we, the, the first tip that we do is open so they can dance with the person they came with. But since we wanna be dynamic dancers, they have an opportunity to, we use the computer rotation system. And so I plug their names in and those people that want to dance both sides can be put in as any, any, any gender. And those that only know one get put in as one. And then the computer assigns us the rest of the tips as to who your partner is going to be. And we don't have, we're not going to have lessons. We have practices and we have dances. And so at our dance practices, they're open. Anybody can come in off the street at any point in time when we will accept them and allow them to join us and start learning. And the people who want to dance the opposite gender and then need the practice, this is how they get the practice to become a dynamic dancer. Everybody is really enjoying it. They're having a lot of fun. Um, we had our first official gathering as a club this past Saturday and um, I do the practices and then we have an outside caller come in uh, to do an actual dance, in which case they would need to know all of the SSD calls because we're going to be an SSD club. Um, but the existing members, some of them are brand new, some of them no plus, some of them no advance, but the, they're all willing to accept anybody in off the street, make them feel welcome because you never know that next person that comes in the door could be the next great dancer or the next great caller. So they're very willing to literally do a beginner class every single time we meet. Now, the next time we, we do it, since we have some, some new people that came last time, if they come back, we're gonna alternate between newbie and experienced uh, each time we get on the dance floor. But once again, the computer assigns us our partner and then they get practice as a left-hand dancer or a right-hand dancer. Um, and we laugh a lot throughout the whole evening. So I'm noticing that we've gone an hour and 10 minutes and want to make sure that uh, nobody feels compelled to stay up beyond their bedtime. Thank you so much, Shaney, for coming and dropping in. And Mel, as always. Uh, Walt suggests that he calls, he and Julie call in the Czech Republic and Slovakia and areas like that. Uh, Walt, take it away, if you would, please. Well... I don't know where uh, Gerhard is located in Germany. I can address a little bit of what's going on. We're in Southern Bavaria, down near Munich. And I can address a little bit of what's going on here, what's going on in the Czech Republic and Slovakia. Um, when we cross the border into 
either of those two countries. It's a dramatic difference. It's a different world. Their dancers, the average age, for example, at the Bratislava Festival, the average age is somewhere between 20 and about 35. It's a much, much younger population. Um, there is quite a language barrier. There's not the, the prevalence of English like in Sweden or a lot of our dancers here in Germany at least have some English. Out there, it's almost non-existent. The only English they understand a lot of the time is literally the calls. Uh, it's a much more energetic audience. They tend to completely disregard anything to do with square dance clothing. You don't see petticoats. You don't see Western shirts. You, you just don't see things like that. Uh, their festivals run a lot longer than the average festival runs in Bavaria. Uh, for example, the Bratislava festival is the first weekend in May. They start dancing at five o'clock Friday night, finish at 11 o'clock Friday night. They start again with early mainstream at nine o'clock Saturday morning and finish at 11 o'clock Saturday night. And then for the colors that survive, they start again at nine o'clock on Sunday morning. This is their average special dance or average festival. Chore choreography wise, they're about on par with Germany. They, they seem to be a little more technically proficient than the dancers we see coming from the US. Um, they prefer things to be a little more technical, a little more difficult, a little more uh, challenging, that kind of thing. And believe it or not, most of their clubs from what we see are growing, right? The last time we were in the Czech Republic, we ran across six or seven clubs we'd never heard of and got told, oh, we just started in the last 12 months and they were dancing four or five squares. So it's, it's, it is growing in those two countries. Um, we've done a little bit in Russia, Hannah, and Lars have done far more in Russia than we have. That's a different world again. 90% or more of the dancers out in Russia are women. The age bracket there, Hannah helped me out, probably 40 to 60 age group. And they tend to be a whole lot less proficient than the dancers in the Czech Republic and Slovakia simply because square dancing's only been going in Russia for 10 or 15 years, and they just don't have the technically proficient callers yet to, to create proficient dancers. They have a lot of fun. They have some people that are going to be very good callers, um, but they're not there yet, all right? This is, Lots of times when they come into Germany to dance or they come into Czech Republic to dance, we see the Russian dancers struggling. They tend to stay in their own group simply because they don't have the experienced callers yet. Um, that's been our experience in those three countries. We've done caller schools in all three. And I have to say that the caller students we run into are very, very, very appreciative of the time in school. They, um, we were, I have to say, very surprised. The first time we took the GSI school to Russia, we said, okay, this is the school schedule. We're gonna start at this time. We're gonna finish at this time. And it was the first, for all you ladies, it was the first all lady school I'd ever done in my entire career. And, and it was amazing. At five minutes to nine, they were in their seats ready to go. And at five in the evening when we were ready to quit, it was, do we have to stop now? We have a few more questions. Uh, this was a five day school and I was dying by day three. So they were amazing students. They were wonderful students. We're, we're ready to go back again as soon as the borders open. The, the Czech and Slovak students are pretty much the same way. It's a little easier there. Um, it's easier to find translators. Russia, we, we really struggled 
finding translators. We were very fortunate. We had one lady who is a retired English teacher and an experienced square dancer. So she at least knew the subject. And I had her over my shoulder the entire school and she could translate just about as fast as I could talk. So that worked out fairly, fairly well. Um, anybody has any questions about the Czech Republic, Slovakia, or Russia, I'd be happy to tell you what we've seen, what we've experienced out there. And I may, I ask, may I ask, uh, what, are, what are the lessons like? How, like beginner lessons, how long do they take? And so Start forth. Say it again, Bray. I would, I would like to know uh, how long the lessons are for the clubs, for, for beginner lessons, say. Um, in Bavaria, we run pretty much the same that Gerhardt described earlier. We start September, October, and generally, generally graduate around May, all right? Now, that's all the way through the mainstream. Um, the Czechs don't run as long, partly because their students are younger, partly because their classes, our classes generally run two to two and a half hours. Uh, their classes, they'll run three hours, and they think nothing of running classes all day on a Saturday if they have a caller available. Um, the Russians, I really can't answer it. We've only ever done workshops and caller schools out there. Maybe Hannah could tell us. Hannah, do you happen to know how long the classes run in Russia? Uh, they don't have a specific time. They go through the program uh, as according, uh, at least in uh, Petrozavodsk in that club, um, because they have good English speaking people. But there are places in Russia when they don't have good English speaking people. And those places they just learn from watching YouTube or uh, doing stuff like that, going to dances. Many of the Russian uh, dancers never learned a special level like A1. They went traveling and learned <laughs> the level on the fly. So it depends if they had English speaking people in the lead of the club. Um, so I saw a question someplace else. Somebody had a hand up. There are eight clubs in Russia, eight clubs in Russia right now. The other thing we see is a lot of the people who are, or most of the people who are, are doing the teaching in Russia don't refer to themselves as callers. I'm a teacher. I only teach. We saw this when we took the JSI school out there is they would, we would ask, how long have you been calling? Oh, I'm not a caller, I only teach. Okay, so it's, it's a different mindset. Thank That's you much. All I've got on. Go ahead, Ray. I'm just saying thank you, it's interesting, interesting stuff. I mean, I think instruction is probably the key to our problem in general, so. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I, Please don't anybody take offense, all right? I'm an American, I was born and raised in Macon, Georgia. But after living in Europe for 30 years and watching the difference between the dancers from the US and the dancers from Europe and Japan, we have a problem. There's a huge, huge divide in ability, all right? We had a tour bus come through last year with, I think it was 45 dancers from somewhere on the West Coast of the United States. And they happened to be here on a night when there was a, a mainstream, it was a caller anniversary celebration. And it was a normal mainstream dance for us. And I guess because they heard me speaking English, they cornered me and actually asked me, what program is he calling? Because we don't understand any of it, all right? And it was standard mainstream for us. This is a huge problem. This is a major problem because there's lots and lots of people come from the United States and come here. And instead of enjoying it, they get horribly disappointed. 
I can give you one illustration of this, and then I'm going to shut up because I've talked enough. The National Square Dance Convention in Oklahoma City. I was calling in the mainstream hall, and I had one square directly in front of me that no matter what I said, they broke down. No matter what I said. So after my time slot, I went and found them. They were standing in a group probably swearing at me. And I said, tell me what's giving you the problem. And this lady literally said, you're not calling swing through properly. I only know one way to call swing through and that's to say swing through. And she looked me right in the eye and said, everybody knows it's swing through boys run. And I said, that's two calls. No, it isn't. And she was adamant that swing through boys run is all one call. So dummy here said, you're telling me you were taught in mainstream lessons that that's all one call. Yep. Well, who's your club caller? Well, that's him right over there. So can't leave it alone. I went to their club caller and said, hey, I just had some of your dancers tell me swing through boys run. They were taught that that's all one call. And he looked at me and said, well, yeah, it is. Enough said. <laughs> Enough said. We have a huge problem in the activity with sloppy teaching. Well, I'm going to right. chime in here and say this is my own personal, my own personal theory. But when you look across the board at any activity, sports activities, anything, there is a bar. You have to know the rules of basketball in order to play basketball. You have to know the rules of this in order to play. You meet that bar. You meet that standard. In square dancing, there is a standard. This is mainstream. This is what you are expected to know at mainstream level. But we don't make the dancers rise to that bar and know the information. We say, oh, wait a second. If they can't dance it, I'm not going to call it. And we just lowered the bar instead of making them achieve the bar. If they can't dance a particular move that is a mainstream call, they need to go back to whoever taught them, their club, their group, their whoever, and say, I couldn't dance at a mainstream dance. Teach me what I need to know. And so we have lowered the bar here in the United States where other countries have not lowered the bar. They teach to that bar. Our bar is very, very low here in the United States. That's my own personal opinion. Oh, I, I think we're I think we're drifting over into another topic of conversation. I do have a question. How many um, square dance clubs out there are dancing in their own dedicated hall? I'm dancing. Does in anybody what? have their? <clears throat> I didn't hear you, John. How many How many clubs out there have their own dedicated hall? It's just square dance hall. In Bavaria, none that I know of. In are the Czech any, Republic. Uh, in the Czech Republic, Slovak Republic, and Russia, none that I know of. How about in the United States? Does anybody have a dedicated hall that's just square dance? Uh, the club that I learned to dance with has a dedicated hall that I, that, um, that is, well, it's, they rent it out for other events, and I think they rent it out for a daycare during the day, oh, but no. it, it's. No, no. There, there are a number of halls that are dedicated for square dancing, like the Hayloft and various other things like that, that aren't specifically square dance halls owned by square dance clubs or owned by square dance organizations. But as you said, even they have, when the hall's not in use, have been letting it out for other venues, well, but that's the well, problem. I, I, must, I must live in a strange area because uh, out here where I am in, you know, in Washington State, the uh, KSDA, which is the Kitsap Square Dancers Association, owns their own hall and it's all square dance and all the time, and they hardly ever rent it out to anything else. It's owned by the square there, dance. There are still a lot of there's still a lot of counties and, and regional organizations that own buildings, and they do that specifically. It yeah. is it's getting more and more uncommon now, though. In yeah, Japan, you know, yeah. In Sweden, we have a couple of clubs that actually are lucky enough to own their own uh, halls. I think we one of my clubs that I I'm involved in. We have our own house. I. I can't call it a hall, it's just kind of a small place, but uh, uh, we own it and the members have to you know, come for weekends and, and um, paint and mend and go up onto the roof and stop it from leaking and that kind of thing. Um, it's good in one way because you don't have expenses uh, and you can 
dare to have a dance which you think maybe won't bring in much money because you know you don't have to rent the hall. Uh, but I'm also a member of other clubs and they rent their hall every week when they're having their, their dance. So I think maybe, uh, Lasse, you, you think there are some other clubs also that own their own their halls, yeah? But I think mostly yeah. you... We yeah. have one here in, uh, I, in, in our I area. don't think it's so many. You don't think it's so many, yeah? No, no I don't think it's so many. No. For us, a lot of we have a lot of large what's known as gast houses which is literally bar restaurant in bavaria in in this area and most of them have some kind of a large hall whether they use it for wedding receptions new year's parties things like that and for the clubs that dance during the week these halls quite often are not in use on monday tuesday wednesday they tend to be used a lot Friday, Saturday, Sunday type things. And of the five clubs that we call for, four of them dance in these Gasthaus halls. And our agreement with the, the owners is we buy all our water, drinks, food, or whatever from the Gasthaus and we use the hall for free. So we're very, very fortunate. That's not the same everywhere in Germany. Um, some friends of ours that are up in the Cologne Dusseldorf area are struggling to find halls. Their clubs are struggling to find affordable halls because they just don't have the same setup. So we're we're very lucky around here. In Japan, there's a, um, a vast network of community centers, public community centers. Uh, in my city, for example, there are 17 of them. Uh, and so uh, and they can be rented for very, very little money. Uh, and so that's, I don't think there, I would be very surprised to hear that there are any clubs that have their own uh, uh, venue. Hannah, does Vinga own their hall or do they rent it? You want to ask them if you Vinga? They own it together with a line dance club. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Okay. Halls in Germany in general, large halls for special events, tend to be a problem. They are expensive, depending on the size of event. They're expensive. There's insurance considerations. There's all kinds of things. Of course, like the rest of the world, we're at a dead stop right now. So it's it's not something we're dealing with at the moment. To add to that, what uh, Walt said, uh, a, a large number of clubs is also in uh, schools or in other public buildings, but uh, mainly schools. And I think that is one of the big concerns now with the COVID that after, uh, well, at present for sure, but also that afterwards, Many schools may say, well, uh, we don't want to have uh, strange people uh, in the evening in the school and next morning have kids here in the school. So uh, this will be the last uh, venues that will be open for square dance again. And uh, that may be a big problem when it comes up, back up. That is well, the Danish yeah. club as well in Denmark. They also mostly use uh, schools in the, in the evening, so that would be the same situation. Most of our clubs are in um, either in the guest house, as I said, or we have quite a few clubs in the area that dance in sports halls. Of course, all sports activities are shut down, but what we're hearing is once indoor sports are started up again, square dancing is just considered to be another indoor sport, so there shouldn't be a problem there. Um, we don't really have any of the dance in schools around this area. Uh, there's a couple of church halls. We don't know what's going to happen with them. Um, and the other one, as Shane mentioned, we have some community centers that hopefully they're going to start their activities programs back up and square dancing is on their list of activities. So best answer I have right now. Um, if I may, Gerhard, 
you mentioned clubs in your area tend to have one caller, all right? It's different down here. A lot of clubs in our area tend to have rotating callers for their club nights. Um, two of the clubs we call for, we share with another caller. Some clubs, you have four or five callers rotating through on club nights. In general, it works okay for club nights, but what we're finding is it's disastrous for lessons. It's a big, big problem when you have three, four, or five people rotating through for lessons. And two of our clubs, fortunately, have discovered this and said, okay, when we start again, we're going to have a maximum of two callers teaching lessons. We think this is going to work a lot better because the last set of lessons we saw had four callers rotating through it. And when they came graduation time, it was pretty disastrous. But can I ask you, you talk about club nights and you talk about lessons. Uh, what's the difference when I translate it in my thinking the Swedish way, we have a club night and there will be lessons. I mean, that, that's what we do on club nights. <laughs> it varies from club to club. Some clubs run a regular, for example, a mainstream club night and a separate night for lessons. This is what I'm talking about. Um, one of our clubs runs an hour and a half of lessons and then an hour and a half of mainstream dancing on the same night. Okay. Um, that works out pretty good because gradually as the class learns more and more and more, they start staying and dancing with the club. So it integrates pretty good. Um, some places run uh, one lesson tip, one mainstream tip, one lesson tip, one mainstream tip. So it, it varies. Yeah. My own preference is clubs that run separate lesson nights. That's, but that's personal preference. Well, we try, we, as I said earlier, we quite often, if, if we have enough people, we have two sort of courses, lessons going simultaneously before the coffee break. And then afterwards we do something different. And mm -hmm. I think that's, that's the thing where we want to try to be a club, a social club where you just don't come to do your mainstream dancing, your tips, and then you go home, but you're, you become sort of part of the club and you are an angel for the lower levels and, and, uh, we want to be sort of kind of a, a social thing as well. Um, so that, that's the way we do it in, the, well, in one of my clubs, we do it differently in, in different clubs, but that's the way we do it in one of the, my main club. Thank Can you I all. just maybe, yeah. maybe, well, uh, I danced in Beijing and I only did it for one festival and well, twice actually. Uh, I, I went on a long trip a couple of years ago and I passed Beijing going out and I passed Beijing coming home. And I was so lucky that both times I was there, there was a big square dance festival. Uh, and on the way out, it was a, a Japanese caller called Don Ogami, I think, who called. And on the way home, it was. Uh, no, the other way around. It was uh, Brian Hodges on the way out and it was Donna Ogami on the way home. Uh, but the thing is that uh, Beijing, which has what, 22 million people uh, and several square dance clubs, they don't have a caller. So if any of you want to sort of start calling in Beijing, there's a huge market. Uh, <laughs> uh, and the, In the festival, which I danced at, there were quite a few dancers. I think there must have been at least a hundred dancers there and they came from different parts of the country. But uh, according to Vicky Sun, the, the Chinese lady I, I contacted with, there is no caller in, uh, in China. So that's something to think about. Um, they don't speak any English. So uh, you have to call only the calls because they don't understand anything in between. And um, yeah, well, it was very strange. Don't call screen then. <laughs> hmm? Don't call screen. <laughs> and I oh, thought yeah. Russia was tough. So, yeah, um, no, no. I know that Brian Hotchkiss has done a bit of calling there, and he's also recorded some, some uh, CDs for them to dance to. And he said that it was very, very, very difficult because he couldn't say one extra word. 
And he said, you know, time and time again, you said all these different filler words. And I think you, in your speaking college, you use a lot more filler words than we, uh, that call in a foreign language. So he said it was extremely difficult and it was ba easy stuff, basic and, and mainstream and that kind of thing, but it was extraordinarily difficult to record it because he had to sort of stop himself from saying all these extra words. Um, yeah. um, on a on a optimistic note, GSI, Grand Square International, has actually been approached about doing a call a week long caller school in Beijing. All right. Now, at the moment, of course not. We we just started looking into what it's going to take to get our instructors out there, and the visa application is about an encyclopedia volume at the moment. So. But they have approached us about it. Can we, could we come out there and do some teaching? So it's on the list for Grand Square Europe to tackle this. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, keep your fingers crossed. Yeah. That's a problem in Japan as well with, um, with uh, when foreign callers come over and they start ad-libbing and like just, um, playing with the calls, uh, saying anything other than the exact thing that is in the caller lab manual, and it'll break everybody down. <laughs> they, they can't catch um, spontaneous English. And so I will be in like a, a you know, a big party and, uh, and I will hear it and I'll be like, whoosh, and let's do that thing. And everybody else is like, what, 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 what? Uh, yeah. <laughs> But that said, that said, I am so used to Japanese calls that it actually it takes me a while to get used to native English speakers as well. <laughs> so uh, I totally, I, I empathize entirely. <laughs> and they always laugh at me when I make a mistake. They're like, Shani, you speak English. You shouldn't make a mistake here. I'm like, I didn't understand it. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just ask you also before we maybe leave, I don't know, but um, on these places I've been dancing, somewhere I've danced circle to a line in a funny way, and I don't know what's happened. Uh, and I don't know what I've done, but it's not done the way Color Lab wants us to do it. And also, I think Alma left. Is it in Australia you do some funny thing with your hand up like this instead of doing the underarm? Is that right? Mm -hmm. I've seen that. Is that like, like, like this? What, what this. they do here, it's called a pigeon wing grip. That was introduced in the 50s and that's become part of the traditional Amer uh, traditional Australian square dance. It is recognized by Color Lab, by Color Lab as a regional difference. I, I personally hate it because it's absolutely dangerous, but it is the way they like to do it traditionally. It's the way they do it to keep their squares small, uh, all those other kinds of things. Um, that That is just a normal way of dancing here. It's been that way for, well, since I uh, said since the 50s. It's actually written into the books that way with the pigeon mm -hmm. wing work, uh, even in, I think, in the definitions, it actually defines a, a forearm grip, a hand grip, or the Australian pigeon wing grip in the definitions when they start talking about regional differences. Uh, what was the first part of your question again? Uh, circle to a line also, they did something yeah. funny uh, somewhere. There, there's a few different variations of a circle to a line. Um, the abhorrent wrong totally abstract timing does not dance and is absolutely unsmooth is the normal heads lead to the right break slide left scamper over move forward and then try and do a reverse wheel around at the same time and adjust your position is the normal circle to a line that happens once dancers start learning plus um, that's really the only way to describe it which is lead to the right, then I want you to sort of veer to the left, sort of halfway veer to the right, do a reverse wheel around and slide while the other people dip around, is the easier way of doing it. And that's also learned at PLUS. Um, although it's not taught anywhere, I have no idea who actually created it. It, it seems that's what everybody does. And the other one, that, it, one of the reasons why I like circle to a line is I personally love doing uh, heads right or I don't know something like a heads half sashay forward and back lead to the right and circle to a line so you end up with the girl boy boy girl girl uh, girl boy boy girl combinations in the center very easy to call very easy to pick up very easy to dance and very easy to say you know if you're going to dance and, and take shortcuts pay attention to what you're doing 
in uh, the U.S., the that the circle of the line, which is lead right, veer left, uh, out facers kind of do a wheel and deal and then slide, you know, that way, as Mel described it, uh, <laughs> is the the gay is completely prevalent in the gay square dance scene mm. and uh, the straight square dance scene usually does this actual circle. The gay square dance scene will teach the circle and then we'll say, but here's how it's actually done at festivals <laughs> and teach the other one. Um, yeah. And I'm trying to think of what the other, there are a couple of other calls like that and that I'm blanking on right now, but that's, oh, uh, so do si do is the Highland Fling is uh, very, uh, almost unheard of in the straight square dance clubs and prevalent in the yeah, gay square and, dance and clubs. The thing is, it used to be so very prevalent. There are actually, it, it is a very common use in some parts of the States with the younger groups. It was quite common in Europe for a long, long time. Still is now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it, well, I, think they, I think you referred to it over there as the Heidi Ho. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The Heidi Ho. I live in when you Kentucky, talk about now that they do the uh, standard do -si do in Kentucky, but yet they'll do the Highland Fling in Tennessee. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I'm confused about the pigeon wing. Is that a hand cl clasp or is that a forearm hand clasp? It's, it, it, it's basically the hands go with the cross palm, but the elbows are together so that your your arm is like this. Because mm -hmm. pigeon wing came out in eighteen in the eighteen twenties, roughly. It's part of the English country dancing, and that's because they didn't want you to dance. So didn't want a lot of hand, didn't want a lot of contact, but that was a hand to hand rather than the elbow swing. Yeah, well, it is, it is a call. crossed hand, but as the hands cross up, the elbow is actually bent and it, it goes down the forearm. Um, the 1800 English country dancing, they stole that from the French, which was the same kind of thing, which was the cross palm. It was there, but it was a maintained contact with the, 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 the step pirouette that was going in the Alaman, which is the German folk dance or the poor man's folk dance. And it was a very easy one to come across and, and marry into Scottish Highland dancing as well for the same. Um, because of the actual, oh, sorry, Dan, go ahead. No, go for it. I was just going to say, because of the difference in the size of the average dancers, um, in Japan, uh, square dancing is a very sort of gentle activity. Um, and my experience in all of the other places that I've danced, it is not. Um, I tend to get kind of thrown around <laughs> in a way that I don't in Japan. Japan is very light touch and, you know, this kind of thing. And, and uh, yeah, in like Germany, uh, everybody is like six feet tall or taller, sweet and the same. Uh, and uh, so I, you know, I'm five foot two, so I'm quite short, um, but I'm average height in Japan. So I'm used to dancing like, you know, people who are the same height, but in, uh, in Europe and, you know, other countries that I've danced in, I'm like going like this and I feel like a child Child when I'm dancing there. So it's a, a big difference. If you come here, be gentle. That say that, Shani, because uh, I, I found the Japanese dancers, they're, it's not so much they're a very light touch. They are very, very gentle. But when they learn, they learn styling as part of the actual movement. They're taught where to put pressure. They're taught that the man's hand is raised. This is the full action for a California twirl for the man. This is the full action for a twirl after a circle of the line. That hand is there, but it's got pressure, but only for support, it's not a grip. There's mm -hmm. none of this swing down or mm -hmm. any of that. And they're taught that pressure, they're taught, taught counter pressure. And when I dance with Japanese ladies, it's the same thing, it's very gentle, but there's the right amount of resistance. It, it's basically like doing a framed round dance with mm -hmm. a proper mm -hmm. lead and response time, both back and forth. And that is taught as part of the teaching of the movement. That hasn't been part of teaching of the movements, at least as, uh, as far as I know. Um, it stopped in Germany uh, um, back about 87, 88, from what I was told. It was still being taught when I left in 83 or 84. And it, it had already stopped in Canada and through most of the states by that time. They stopped teaching styling for the challenge of who could get to the finish line first and get on to the next level rather than uh, who can dance the program successfully. Yeah, I would say like, I don't know that, like I wouldn't, I don't know how it works in other countries, but yeah, in, in Japan, I feel that there's one dancer in my club who doesn't do that. One, one male dancer who doesn't like give you the right support for 
you know, an Alamand left or a, a swing or something like that. And I'm always yelling at him. I'm like, you have to support me. <laughs> yeah, and so I think that of, is. A lot of people say natural. Japanese dancers are very light to the touch. It's almost like dancing with air. But mm -hmm. I've found that they are very easy to dance with because they do have the right amount of pressure at the right time for the movements, mm -hmm. as opposed to very gentle dancers, which is like trying to dance with a limp fish that has mm -hmm. absolutely nothing there. You know, you have no idea. I've never yeah. found that. I never found a Japanese dancer that was like that yet. Yeah, that, there's one in my club. But yeah, in general, you you can you can feel like it's a, it's a very tactile thing. I think, uh, which is unusual because in Japan there isn't a lot of interaction. There isn't a lot of social touching, yeah, um, I, I, not I, hugs I, and I, things I, like I, that. Probably one of the reasons why square dancing is actually as popular as it is. Uh, mm, or, or became as popular as was with the younger generation because it was at that time of the social stratas, the tradition of segregation between the genders, mm -hmm. but the incoming and inclusive post-occupation of wanting to join the rest of the world. It was a venue, it, it was the same as rock and roll dances in the clubs, but that was not mm -hmm. acceptable because you were there as a single square mm -hmm. dancing, you were there as a couple. It was a social touching, but it was a safe social touching that they get away with. And it was a beautiful bridge mm -hmm. to that integration of the community. I think that's why it took off so well. Could be. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to have to say good night, everybody. My lovely night. wife has just informed me that the full menu is ready. And I'm sorry, but that takes priority. <laughs> Go for it, and no, uh, for everybody else, no, uh, no obligation to stick around. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was that a um, on a heads promenade halfway, uh, in some of the gay clubs, we'll see a, a um, see a Highland fling in the middle, and in others, it's just up to the middle and back. Mm. <clears throat> um, well, thank you all for, I think we've kind of hit that lull in the conversation. And I have a neighbor who wants to do a dump run, although I can leave this open for as long as possible. Thank you all for coming. This was this was really cool. Thank you for Helen for suggesting this. Thank you, Shaney, for showing up because I haven't seen you since Toronto. That's right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My pleasure, I'm, I'm glad I stayed up. It's now quarter to three in the morning. <laughs> Uh, it's 4.47 uh, here, Shani. And I, what time is it for you? It's 4.47 here, and I have been going since, oh my god, 7.45 on Friday morning. Oh my goodness. It's 4.47 <laughs> Sunday morning here. Sunday morning, and yeah. I haven't been to bed yet. Uh, we, yeah. will, we will be seeing you in another few hours, Mel, isn't that right? Yep. 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 Another, oh, wow. Right. Another, another okay. four hours. Bye-bye until then. Bye-bye. Okay. Thanks for the Bye. Uh, and thank you, everybody else, for coming in and, and talking about this. This was great and fascinating. Thanks, all. Cool. Thank Good night. Bye-bye. Nice Take to care. meet you. Thanks for hosting, Dan. Yep. All right.